What is going on YouTube, Tizzy here, and today we're going to be exploring a relatively new ROM hack that I was recently alerted to, known as Pokemon Fire Red Advance Challenge. I do want to go over what this ROM hack's all about, so I'm going to run the intro parts of the game in the background while I discuss some of its most important changes. First, I just want to give a huge shout out to the creator, Devlane, as well as all other ROM hackers who dedicate so much time, mostly for free, into creating their own, better version of the Pokemon experience. As somebody who knows nothing about the ROM hacking process, I tend to hold back criticism of any kind, just because I know it's way harder than it appears, and I just want to put it out there that these people deserve nothing but the utmost respect for their voluntary hard work and dedication. Anyways, let's get straight into this. If you've been following my channel for a while now, you most likely know I'm not a big fan of Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, or even Kanto in general. Oh boy, Gen 1ers are going to be all up on me in this comment section. In all seriousness, it normally takes a lot of changes in a Fire Red ROM hack to catch my attention, but when I saw this little graphic, I just had to see what this was all about. As you can see, apparently battles are in doubles format, something I'm not familiar with at all, but have always been kind of interested in learning. And then there's that whole last sentence, or last word rather. Y'all know the self-proclaimed Emerald Kaizo Master's always up for a challenge. Anyways, taking a quick look at the features, I already fell in love with the very first one. Basically, it takes a page out of Renegade Platinum's book and balances out every single Pokemon. The bad Pokemon now have viability, something I've always been a huge fan of since it encourages much more creativity and strategy. Also, apparently there's a total of 61 boss battles, including Johto and Hoenn gym leaders, as well as Elite Four members, which seems like a lot of added fun. Here's a quick peek at the rest of the added quality of life changes. There are some really good ones in here. The biggest one for me is the fact that all Pokemon will have perfect IVs. This is something I've always wanted Game Freak to do, where they have a separate game mode for competitive play, where you can get everything at their full potential. It also looks like we'll be able to be super creative with our movesets, as there are infinite TMs and move tutor moves, as well as a free move relearner later in the game. The national dex is available, which means we'll have access to every Pokemon introduced in the first three generations, and overall, these types of quality of life changes are always music to my ears. Anyways, in terms of rules and restrictions, I don't have too many because I just want to simply enjoy this game, but I will be playing in set mode as always, no items will be allowed in battle, which is an actual feature in the game itself, and lastly, I will play with a level cap of the next gym leader's highest level Pokemon, so that the game can maintain its challenging aspect. So without further ado, let's hop straight into this and pick our starter. As I said earlier, this is definitely my type of game, being that they buff a lot of bad Pokemon, so throughout this run, I promise I'm going to be catching some lesser used Pokemon, but for the beginning, pretty much every starter is popular, so I decided to go with everyone's favorite, Charmander, who I nicknamed Charmello Anthony, and then we launched straight into battle against our rival Gavin. Unfortunately, just like all my other challenge videos, my first rival battle doesn't go my way, after a lot of scratch and tackle spam, we fall one turn short of KOing the Squirtle, giving me the first of potentially many losses I'll be experiencing during this playthrough. Quick summary check, Charmander's a naive nature, which is actually fine since they buffed Charizard to attack a little, and gave it the ability Hyper Cutter as well as access to Dragon Dance, so this could work as a mixed attacker. It's also holding an XP share, which is going to be a great help for leveling up new captures. Since the first route is pretty much the same with the typical Pidgey Rattatas, I went over to the route west of Viridian City, where I found and caught a Mankey. Primeape gets a bit of an offensive boost with plus 10 to its attack and speed, plus I need something for Brock anyways since I start out with Charmander. This same route has a bunch of random trainers, including what looks to be Lance himself. We can't challenge them yet though until later, except for this guy with the blue hair. Turns out it's actually Faulkner who has a level 7 Pidgey and a level 9 Pidgeotto, just like in Gold and Silver. Even though I've trained my Pokemon to match his levels, I stood no chance against that Pidgeotto. It has Air Cutter which hits both Pokemon and is super effective against Mankey, so Faulkner makes quick work of our team. Since the battle seemed optional, I decided to move on to battle our rival Gavin, who has caught a Pidgey since we last saw him. I go for Ember on Pidgey and actually score a burn, which is nice for Mankey, being able to take flying hits, and then I go for a low kick and get a crit on Squirtle, so things were seeming to go my way. Except, apparently Gavin cheated a TM for Rain Dance onto Squirtle, and he also reveals that he actually has the Rain Dish Leftovers combination. With Mankey being at minus 2 attack from Pidgey's Feather Dance, I have no clue how I'm going to take out the Squirtle. 
While I'm doing no kinds of damage to it, Gavin out of nowhere pulls out the freaking Surf. Bro, you can't even get the HM for Surf till the Safari Zone, so I know for a fact this dude has action replay codes. He's got the aimbot on and probably walls, but point is, there's no way I'm winning this game. Pidgey finishes us both off with an air cutter, and we have officially lost our first three battles of this ROM hack. I don't think this has ever happened to me before. I'm also kind of becoming super broke, so at this point, I don't even care to grind and try to beat them. I'm just gonna move onwards to Viridian Forest. Outside the forest, I run into a worm pool that I end up catching because Beautifly is actually pretty good in this game. They gave it plus 20 to practically all its stats, and the ability Hustle, which boosts attack tremendously at the cost of some accuracy. As you know, both Stab Bug and Stab Flying are physical in this gen, so I'd be really weird to not want to try out a physical Beautifly. Problem is, I have no way of knowing if this thing is going to turn into a Silcoon or a Cascoon. Luckily, thanks in part to the XP share, we grow Wurmple to level 7 during a match against a Bug Catcher in the Viridian Forest, and our first Wurmpool does evolve into Silcoon, meaning we'll have Beautifly very, very soon. I absolutely need to grind for Brock's Gym since I started with Charmander, so along the way, I'm able to grow Silcoon to level 10 and evolve it into Beautifly, which learns the ever-so-powerful 20 base power Absorb, but at least being times 4 super effective should be very helpful. It's time to challenge the original simpiest of simps. Brock's got his typical two Pokemon, Onix and Geodude, as I lead off with Mankey and Beautifly. Onix has 90 base speed in this game, so it goes first and sets up a Sandstorm, which shouldn't matter too much since Rock types don't get the special defense boost in Gen 3. Beautifly's Absorb does an embarrassing amount to it, and my second attack on Onix with Mankey's Low Kick still doesn't do the trick. I figured going after the higher level Onix would be smarter, but it's actually Geodude who's the bigger threat. It's got a higher attack, and its rock slide absolutely crumbles Beautifly. I can still win this game though. I bring in Charmander to finish off Onyx with my new move, Metal Claw, but Mankey's Karate Chop misses Geodude after it got mud slapped by Onyx, which is crucial in deciding the outcome of this game. Charmander somehow survives, but after the Sandstorm, I essentially need to take out this Geodude with Metal Claw plus Karate Chop in one hit, or both my Pokemon will fall to rock slide. I get a nice critical hit with Metal Claw, which should easily ensure Mankey's KO, but I miss again, and Geodude is able to land both rock slides to finish me off. Just absolutely brutal hacks there, but at least we know what we can do differently for take two. This time, I'm gonna focus on that Geodude. I can't imagine myself ever saying this, but it was the much bigger problem for my team. Onyx hits Mankey with a Toxic, but the combination of Absorb and Karate Chop is plenty enough to take out Geodude before it can even go for Rock Slide. Now we're definitely in business. Onyx hits another Mud Slap on Mankey, but we're not gonna miss Low Kick this time. We drop Onyx to a very low amount of health, to the point where Beautifly can easily take it out the following turn with Absorb. It goes to show how different these double battle games can be if you just change up a tiny bit of your strategy. Anyways, we defeat Brock for the Boulder Badge. On our way to Mount Moon, we run into Bugsy, a Johto Gym Leader, but luckily, I had already caught a Pidgey in between, which should be able to help against his bugs. He leads with his two Cocoons. I end up going for Double Gust on Kakuna, which surprisingly works out very well for me. Beautifly's Gust is an easy Oko because of Hustle, and the incoming Scyther now has to take Pidgey's Gust for free, unreciprocated damage. After Metapod's Tackle does nothing to Pidgey, Scyther's Aerial Ace shockingly doesn't kill Beautifly, it lives with a sliver of health thanks to that extra bulk it received, and I'm able to fire back a Hustle Boosted Gust followed by Pidgey's Gust to get rid of Bugsy's Ace. Even though we have to go through the embarrassment of having a Pokemon die to a Metapod Tackle, we can just bring in Charmander to finish up the battle with an Ember-Gust combo. After the game, Bugsy straight up gifts us a Scyther. I was more than pleasantly surprised and did not expect to get anything out of these boss battles, so now that I got such a great reward, let's go back and get our revenge against Faulkner. We obviously destroy him now that we're much higher level, and on top of that, Charmander also evolves into Charmeleon. I was over here thinking we'd get another dope Pokemon, but no, Faulkner just gives us TM40 Aerial Ace, which is still really cool since TMs are unlimited in this game, and a lot of my current members can benefit from having that move. By the way, speaking of cool features, another random one in this game is there's a key item called the Nicknamer, so you don't have to go to the Name Raider anymore. I take this opportunity for yet another NBA reference. Scyther's a Praying Mantis, so we're gonna go with Legendary Sharpshooter, Prey Allen. Next, we go through Mount Moon, and I've been informed that you're not a real Pokemon Challenge YouTuber unless you show the part where you pick the Helix fossil 
Apostle? Apparently it does some kind of weird voodoo magic that makes people comment and influence the YouTube algorithm, so I figured I'd give it a shot. Anyways, outside Mount Moon, there's another optional boss battle, this time Brawly from the Hoenn region, who has fighting types. I figured I'd be fine underleveled since I have so many flying types. He leads with Metatite and Makuhita, who both go for fake outs just to be annoying. After flinching though, it's time to show off our new move, Aerial Ace, which by the way is awesome for helping with the accuracy drop that Beautifly gets from Hustle. And we straight up annihilate that Makuhita, and then it's Scyther's turn to one-shot the Metatite. Machop doesn't even get a split second to breathe here, and we absolutely destroy Brawly, who I thought would give me some kind of cool reward like the others, but this surfer dude literally just doesn't care. Along the way to Cerulean City, there's some cool grass types in the grass, which is for obvious reasons. We're gonna need help against Misty, so I catch this Roselia since it got an amazing boost compared to the other grass types. No Roserade in this game, no problem. We've been picking up some pretty good momentum after a rough start, and we're looking to increase it against our rival who surprises us at the Nugget Bridge. Gavin leads off with Abra and Pidgeotto, who don't take too kindly to Aerial Ace spam, and even though Air Cutter hits both of my Pokemon super effectively, it really doesn't do much damage even with a crit on Scyther. Same play here, just spamming more TM40, Pidgeotto goes down, and Gavin stupidly hasn't evolved his Squirtle on time like always, making this a whole lot easier for our squad. He actually pulls out another hacked TM move in Ice Beam to take out Scyther. I swear this guy's just walking around with an action replay shoved into his game, but it's all good. Beautifly finishes off with Aerial Ace, and all that's left is his measly Rattata. After beating Gavin, we make our way up to Bill's house to get more training before we take on Misty, and Pidgey evolves into Pidgeotto. We get our free SS ticket for saving Bill from a disastrous experiment, and then right outside his house, Whitney is just chilling here. Which kind of makes sense since she's all about using Attract, and isn't this Misty's makeout bridge? Anyways, Whitney only has Clefairy and Miltank just like in regular Johto, so obviously Mankey's a really good idea here. Even a Hustle boosted Aerial Ace and Low Kick don't take out Miltank, it's just that bulky, but thankfully in doubles, we can always focus on killing the bigger threat first, so we're able to eventually drop Miltank and then focus our attention on the weaker Clefairy. Funnily enough, Whitney also pulls out a random Ice Beam out of nowhere. Maybe she's the secret TM supplier that Gavin's going to, but anyways, we are able to easily finish it off with Karate Chop for the victory over Whitney, which actually rewards us a pretty solid gift in an amulet coin. Time to take on gym number two. Misty's got her typical starfish combo, but by now, my Roselia is decently leveled and up for the task. She reveals the incredibly powerful Psykick, which scared the hell out of me, but Roselia somehow takes it like an absolute tank. Scyther gets an Aerial Ace crit on Starmie, and we're able to bring it down to the point where it's in range of quick attack. Had Starmie killed Roselia, we would have had some problems here, but thankfully we can just focus on Staryu now. Mega Drain is doing a nice chunk even through Light Screen, and it's pretty much game since Misty's messing around trying to status us still. After Staryu finally goes down, we're able to grab the easy victory for the Cascade Badge. Apparently, you can get all Johto and Hoenn starters in the routes between Cerulean and Vermilion City, so I decided to just pick one, and I ended up catching Mudkip, which should be helpful at least once it evolves for Lieutenant Surge's gym. Before we handle that though, we gotta hop on board the SS and where we find our rival. After the battle, which really wasn't too much of a difference from the last time we battled him in Cerulean anyways, we get Mudkip to evolve into Marsh Tomp and learn Mud Shot. And then the captain, who obviously had one too many, gives us the HM for cut, allowing us access to the next gym. Which segues us perfectly into the Lieutenant Surge battle. He leads off with Pikachu and Voltorb, and Voltorb actually has the Rain Dance, which boosts Pikachu's Surf. I really appreciate when ROM hackers create mini strategies like this for their gym leaders. Unfortunately for Surge though, I've got the double dig action. Both my Pokemon go underground and KO Voltorb and Pikachu. All that's left is Raichu. Thunder Spam in the rain is really cool, but it's not even enough to take out Charmeleon. And then the digging duo continue to shovel their way through this one, taking out Raichu and getting us a very easy Thunder Badge. I know that wasn't enough digging for y'all to see, so don't worry, on our way to Rock Tunnel we find Watson, another electric gym leader, this time from the Hoenn region. Here's some of the extra digging you guys ordered. I actually wanted to show this entire battle as comic relief. This was the worst AI battle I've ever seen. Watson had to have been throwing or getting paid on the side. 
After Voltorb gets up a light screen and both of my Pokemon go underground, Watson goes for a second layer of light screen and tries to crunch the Pokemon that's already underground. Voltorb goes down to Dig while Electrike goes down to Ember, and Watson's last members are Magneton and Manectric. This is where it gets crazy. Magneton goes for a sleep talk when it's wide the hell awake. Then, even though it's right in front of his very eyes, Manectric goes for Crunch on Marshtomp instead of Charmeleon, allowing both of my Pokemon to get off free digs once again. For god knows what reason, Magneton goes for sleep talk once again and proceeds to get dropped by Marshtomp in one hit. Now, you'd think Watson would learn from his mistakes, right? Like, maybe just attack the thing that's visible in front of your eyes? Yeah, that's gonna be a no. He goes for T-Bolt on Charmeleon, which obviously misses, and then afterwards he goes for Crunch on Marshtomp after a Marshtomp goes underground. Like, this had to be the most intentional throw I've ever seen. I don't know about your guys' experience, but the AI is incredibly stupid sometimes, but this was a whole nother level. Anyways, we defeat Watson, and he doesn't even give us anything for a reward. Like, what? What is the point of you? Moving on, in the rock tunnel, not too much interesting stuff here, but out of nowhere we find an unknown. I actually catch it because this is probably the one game where it's usable. They gave it plus a hundred special attack. Just take a look at this, we caught one with a mild nature which boosts its special attack even more, and it's got 67 special attack as an untrained, uninvested level 15 Pokemon. It also gets access to Stab Psychic later, and since everything has 31 IVs, a max power HP Dark is still pretty decent. Anyways, before we go into the Pokemon Tower, we actually find Morty chilling outside there. I just love how a lot of the locations of some of the gym leaders make sense. Like, Morty for sure is going to be hanging by a cemetery. Anyways, Beautifly's Aerial Ace is an easy Oko on Ghastly, but unfortunately, Haunter hits Hypnosis, rendering us useless for a few turns. This Morty is a lot smarter than the Gen 2 Morty. He wisely taught Haunter Thunderbolt, which Beautifly does survive with red HP. After putting Marshtomp to sleep as well because Sleep Claws doesn't exist, we're lucky that Beautifly wakes up and gets off an Aerial Ace to take out the left side Haunter. Gengar of course is his last, and he shows the Giga Drain. Morty just has all the coverage out here. Luckily, Beautifly somehow survived long enough to take out three of his Pokemon before finally going down to Gengar's Fire Punch. But at this point, Roselia gets off a Stun Spore on Gengar, and I have too many Pokemon in the back to deal with this. After a bit of stalling here and there, Roselia is able to take down Gengar for the dub. After the battle, unlike Watson, Morty actually gives us something useful in TM30 Shadow Ball. Without the Sylph Scope, there's really nothing to do for now other than to hit up Celadon City and go to our favorite spot with all the ladies, Erica's Grass Gym. She leads off with Tangela and Victory Bell. Tangela and its low special defense is easy work for Charmeleon as Flamethrower is an Oko. After Vileplume comes out next, Victory Bell sets up a sunny day. I'm assuming they both have Chlorophyll, and since they're a lot higher level, this might actually be a problem. Unknown Psybeam does an insane amount honestly to Victory Bell, but it doesn't quite do it. Vileplume Sludge Bomb is a 2 KO on Charmeleon, and Erica shows off the Chesto Resto set on Victory Bell, just getting all of its health right back. Even a sun-boosted, stab, super effective flamethrower doesn't kill Vileplume. I do get a lucky burn, but these two Pokemon are just refusing to die. Victory Bell sends Unknown straight to its grave with a Sludge Bomb, and Vileplume's Solar Beam is just enough, even resisted, to take out Charmeleon. It's now up to Roselia and Beautifly to finish this thing up. Venusaur rests just because Erica loves wasting our time. It still doesn't go down to Hustle Boosted Aerial Ace, but Vileplume finally goes down to Roselia's cut. All that's left is a sleeping Victory Bell, and we are finally able to grab the victory over Erica for our fourth badge, the Rainbow Badge. As much as I love spending my free time spinning on tiles and battling Giovanni, we've got a lot more important stuff to cover, so let's just grab the Sylph Scope and head straight over to the Pokemon Tower where Mr. Fuji is, save him, and get ourselves the Poke Flute to finally be able to move onwards. That Poke Flute, of course, is for a Snorlax, but look who's chilling right next to it. We find Hoenn Gym Leader Flannery, who at this point is under leveled and absolutely light work for Marsh Tom. Little fun fact by the way, they did give stuff like Torkoal Drought, a lot of this game especially being doubles is now weather based, which should become pretty challenging later, but for now, Flannery is easy work and the combination of Unknown and Marshtomp is enough to take down Torkoal. Mankey finally evolves after the battle, I've been waiting on this primate for such a long time, and then we go move Snorlax out of the way which normally is a pain to catch, but I actually caught it with a Pokeball here. I know my Twitch viewers are going to be super happy about that one. Anyways, we finally can now go to Fuchsia City through the bike path. 
Y'all know I gotta hit up the Safari Zone first. They actually didn't change Wild Encounters here too much, so I wasn't really planning on catching anything until this happened. We just found ourselves a full lot shiny, but of course, knowing my luck, it's a freaking ugly Parasect. But at least it did get its defenses severely buffed. Y'all know the rules, if I catch this thing, I gotta use it on my team. That's a pretty big if, by the way. I threw like 10 Safari Balls, but much to my surprise, it didn't run, and I was actually able to catch a Shiny in the Safari Zone. No complaints whatsoever here whenever a Shiny is caught. Anyways, we find the nasty gold teeth on the ground for the Warden to give us the HM for strength later. And speaking of HMs, we finally receive HM03 Surf, from this quarantine specialist deep inside the safari. That guy's either a serious introvert or he's just a Pokemon Challenges YouTuber. No going outside for him. Anyways, I am a little underleveled right now for Koga, but it's as if the ROM hacker planned this out, because there are literally five boss battles in this city alone for training. We're gonna skip through these pretty fast. Let's start off with Jasmine, who's chilling right next to the Pokemon Center. She's got the two Magnemites and a Steelix as always. That's easy work for our two starters, Charmeleon and Marsh Tomp. And after we take out Steelix for the win, Jasmine actually gives us something, although not very useful, in TM23 Iron Tail. Old Man Price is up next. His Ice type stood no chance against Primeape and Charmeleon, and in all honesty, I think Price has given us the best reward so far with TM13 Ice Beam. That's definitely going to be useful for stuff like Lance's Dragons later. Anyways, Daddy Norman is also over here, which doesn't at all surprise me since this man stays abandoning his family over at the Hoenn region. His normal type team is no match for Primeape whatsoever, and of course, after we beat him, he doesn't give us crap, but that's really to be expected from someone who can't even take care of his own family. Next, although her English suddenly became very strange, Winona is also over here with all her birds. If you beat her, she gives you absolutely nothing, so don't even waste your time. Just for that, we're not going to give her any camera time. And last but not least, standing next to the Safari Zone is actually the last Johto Gym Leader, Claire. This one was a bit more of a struggle, so let's take a look at what went down. She leads off with two Dragonairs, which are pretty high level, and they've got some really good support moves here. One Dragonair goes for a Thunder Wave on Unknown, and the other sets up a light screen, making this infinitely harder for me. Luckily though, Unknown pulls out a crit Psychic and one-shots the Dragonair, while Marsh Taunt gets a freeze with Ice Beam on the other one. Pretty dang lucky start for us. Anyways, even being 9 levels under, Unknown takes an Ice Beam from Kingdra, and we're able to get off a Mud Shot to slow it down. Meanwhile, we also get a Psychic Spideffall on Kingdra, while Dragonair actually thaws out, thanks in part to its Shed Skin ability. Unknown finally goes down the following turn, but at this point, I can just bring out Primeape and go for my favorite thing ever, which is Gen 3 Brick Break shattering a screen. Gotta love that animation anytime you can get it. Eventually, Marsh Tomp goes down, but we finally take out Kingdra, and then the combination of Primeape and Beautifly is way too much for Claire to handle. After the battle, for the first time since Bugsy gifted us that Scyther, we get a gift Pokemon Dratini from Claire, which is a super cool idea. I highly doubt that I'll be using Dragonite just because it seems a bit OP, but I really like this concept from the ROM hack. Anyways, I think we're pretty much ready to take on the Fuchsia City Gym, home of Koga and his invisible walls. He leads off with Coughing and Muck, who are significantly higher level, but we've got somewhat of a typing advantage with Unknown and Marsh Tomp. I choose to double attack the bigger threat Muck here with both Mudshot from Marsh Tomp and Psychic from Unknown, and the two attacks prove much too strong for even Muck and its bulk to handle. Meanwhile, all we took was Brick Break damage on Marsh Tomp and a Will-O-Wisp onto Unknown, which doesn't really matter too much anyway since I'm a special attacker. Koga now has two coughings out, but we make quick work of one of them with Unknown Psychic, and then Weezing comes out, which is a whole seven levels higher than even our Marsh Tomp. Nonetheless, Unknown sponges the Sludge Bomb from the weaker coughing, and then Koga stupidly attacks Marsh Tomp rather than taking out Unknown. That's definitely going to prove to be his downfall as Psychic obliterates Weezing and Surf is just enough for coughing. We finish the battle with no casualties for the Soul Badge, and a nice little bonus prize here as well with Marsh Tomp finally evolving into Big Swampert. We move ahead to Silphco in Saffron City, where once again, our rival comes to surprise us. Newsflash, we destroy him, and, well, shoot, this very nice person gives us a Lapras too. What we really came here for was to take down Giovanni. He leads off with Nidorino and Kangaskhan, but luckily, I have the perfect Pokemon to take them on. While Primeape gets flinched by Fake Out, I go for Surf to ensure Kangaskhan is in range of Primeape's Cross Chop the following turn, and after we do end up taking it out, he sends out his ace, Nidoqueen. 
Even though Nidorino got its health back with Chesto Resto, Mudshot is a clean Oko, and all I gotta do now is weaken Nidoqueen with Primeape's strength while spamming Surf, which should easily take out Rhyhorn. Primeape goes down to Sludge Bomb, but we might as well use this opportunity to bring out Charmeleon, who could use the experience to grow to level 36 for his final evolution. After Nidoqueen goes down and we defeat Giovanni for the second to last time, we not only finally score ourselves a Charizard, but the big CEO boss man gives us the coveted prize, the Master Ball. At the Saffron City Gym, not only will you find the psychic leader Sabrina, but there's also the twin gym leaders Tate and Lisa from Hoenn, and Elite Four member Will from Johto. Fun fact by the way, I was today years old when I found out Tate is actually apparently a he slash him. I feel like I was lied to my entire life, but what isn't a lie is that this playthrough is dragging out a little bit too long, I did not realize how long it would take to narrate each and every boss battle. Point is, we won both, and Will gives us a smoochum, which is really cool, but let's head on over to get our next badge. Sabrina leads off with Mr. Mime and Kadabra, two very weak physical defenders, and Beautify Silverwind just drops Mr. Mime. Kadabra can try to stay calm all at once, but my unknown's HP Dark wrecks it down to red health. I take this next turn just to finish off Kadabra with Aerial Ace, since it is a bit of a threat at plus one, but on hindsight, maybe it was better to get rid of Venomoth since it does put Unknown to sleep. Alakazam is Sabrina's last, I still remember how much I struggled with this Pokemon back in Gen 1 as a mere child. But not today, we've got Beautify taking a super effective Fire Punch from Zam with one HP, and not only firing back a Silver Wind to knock it out in one hit, but even pulling off the Omni Boost. Y'all can't even hate, Beautify has been an absolute beast, it deserves a rest, and Venomoth does that for us with Sleep Powder. We've got a whole slumber party out in the field right now. Things do get a little bit scary after Venomoth also gets the Omni Boost here, but luckily, Unknown wakes up and KOs it with a crit Psychic that may have mattered since Venomoth had the plus one, but we're not gonna worry about that, let's just take the Marsh Badge and move onwards. Next gym is in Cinnabar Island, Blaine leads off with two baby Pokemon, like, bro, you're the seventh gym leader and you're still out here playing Little Cup? Anyways, I set up a DD with Charizard because I can, but I actually get put to sleep by Ponyta's Hypnosis before Swampert can get off a Surf, which surprisingly doesn't take out either Pokemon. Growlithe does get up a sunny day to weaken my water moves, but that is not saving it from going down. Ponyta lives to see another day, as Blaine brings out Growlithe's angry parent Arcanine, who gets off another Intimidate to put Swampert at minus two attack. Because of that, I'm just gonna be spamming Surf, but it still does close to nothing to Arcanine. At this point, since Charizard refuses to wake up, I make the switch into Parasect as fodder, wanting to reset my attack stat and also fearing the potential Solar Beam. After finally waking up, Charizard gets off a second DD, but much to my dismay, they chose this turn to double attack it, which means I've now set up for absolutely nothing. I am now in range of Arcanine's extreme speed, and Charizard is gonna have to go down. Somehow though, things are kinda looking up, Parasect is still alive here, and is able to get off a Spore on Arcanine. And the Sunny Day also comes to a stop. Primeape's Rock Tomb should help slow Rapidash down before Primeape goes down, and then at this point, we can just go right back into Swampert. Because of the Rock Tomb, Swampert can now outspeed Rapidash and take it down with Mudshot, and a sleeping Arcanine is not gonna be enough for Blaine here. We actually ended up one-shotting it with a critical hit Surf, which really just saved time, and the Volcano Badge is now ours. On Cinnabar Island, the trainers you can battle are the Gym Leader version of Wallace and the Johto version of Elite Four Bruno. If you're playing along with me and want to just get some really cool stuff from these boss battles, huge tip, don't waste your time on Wallace, he doesn't give you crap. But Bruno actually gives you a pretty useful item in Choice Band. At the Viridian City Gym, similar concept here, you can battle both Hoenn Elite Four Sydney or Johto Elite Four Karen. I did battle both, but the one I want to highlight is Karen, who is really easy to take down and gives you an amazing reward, the Lucky Egg. Finally, it's time to reveal that elusive 8th gym leader. Big surprise, it's Giovanni, who's somehow capable of being a full-time boss at Team Rocket while also running a gym. He leads off with Dugtrio and Rhyhorn. Dugtrio actually has Sandstream in this, as well as the random Aerial Ace. I don't know what shocked me more, the fact that Dugtrio had that move, or the fact that Parasect ate it for supper. Surf bulldozes through his team, and even though Dugtrio lives with a tiny sliver of health, it's finished off by Parasect's Giga Drain. Out come Nidoqueen and another Rhyhorn. One thing I never understood is why Giovanni's ace Pokemon, the one level 50 that he has, is a Rhyhorn. Like, dude, why does nobody know how to evolve in this game? 
Nidoqueen goes for Toxic on Parasect, which really doesn't matter because this is about to be a wrap anyways. Surf doesn't take out Nidoqueen of course, but Rhyhorn goes down easily, probably the worst ace Pokemon I've ever seen in any Pokemon game. Giovanni misses Toxic on Swampert, and then Parasect once again eats an Ice Beam. The added bulk that they gave Parasect really does show here. And now Surf can just KO Nidoqueen, as well as bring Nidoking low enough to where Giga Drain almost takes it out. But once again, Parasect just decides, nah, I don't feel like dying today. It dodges Megahorn, and then Swampert finishes off Nidoking just to give me the 6-0 and a very easy final Earth Badge. Y'all already know what time it is. It is now officially time to head over to the Elite Four. Remember at the very beginning of this video, we saw some trainers here who we could not battle yet? While we definitely can now, it turns out this weird little kid sprite is actually Silver. We beat him pretty easily and he doesn't deserve any screen time cause he's honestly just super rude. And well, the other battle is Johto Lance, who we're gonna end up facing for the Elite Four anyway, so let's not do a sneak preview on how that's gonna go just yet. Oh, and also, he gives you leftovers as a reward. I'm really digging these extra prizes that were added in since some of them are very rare and very useful. Like I always say in my challenge videos, I like cutting straight to the Elite Four, no messing around with a victory road. Let's take a look at the team we're bringing for the final challenge. So as you can clearly see, I decided to bring a bunch of memes just to show them some love. We don't discriminate on this channel. It's been cool owning everybody with Swampert and Charizard, but I think it's time to use some truly never used Pokemon. After all, every bad mon did get buffed in some way, which is the beauty of this ROM hack, so why not take advantage of that? Taking a look at the team, our first member is Ladian, who is rocking leftovers and a bold nature because this thing got really, really bulky. They gave it plus 20 to HP, defense, and special defense, and even plus 20 to speed. I think it now has something like 130 base special defense, which is actually crazy. Anyway, since this is doubles format, I felt like I would need some support type of Pokemon, and Ladian does it really well, because it not only gets up screens, but it can also baton pass agilities, which is going to be amazing for a certain certain Pokemon that I've already been using during this playthrough. Next, we have Lame Pikachu, also known as Plusle, who is rocking a magnet with a hasty nature. Couldn't quite find Timid or Modest, so this will have to do, but anyways, they gave it plus 20 to HP, special attack and speed, which reminds me of a much flimsier Raikou. Anyways, it has Lightning Rod, which is a very good ability in doubles to draw away any electric type moves that might want to hit, for example, Ladian. And my moveset is also very support-like, since in Gen 3, electric types get no kinds of coverage whatsoever. I really only need Thunderbolt to be honest, but Thunder Wave is here for status, Encore and Helping Hand are just very strong moves in doubles, and you'll see exactly why later. Next we have Dunsparce with a brave nature holding leftovers. You can actually get multiple leftovers in this game which is really cool. Now in terms of the stats, it got a plus 20 boost to HP and a plus 10 boost to defense. Nothing too crazy. It also got plus 20 to speed, but that's basically useless since it's way too slow regardless. There were so many better normal types out there, but I really just wanted to use this absolute derp of a Pokemon. It has Serene Grace, which is really cool, but unfortunately, you can't even get Body Slam or Headbutt till after the Elite Four. So this Pokemon's main viability is kind of useless. At least we can kind of spam Thunder Wave and a very weak Rock Slide for Paraflinch. I have Return for Stab and EQ for coverage, but don't count on this thing doing too much in the Elite Four. Next, we have Delibird, also known as Mrs. Claus. This thing was shown all kinds of love in this game. Just take a look at those stats. They gave it plus 30 HP, plus 35 attack, plus 35 special attack, and plus 35 speed, which essentially makes it an extremely potent mixed attacker. Couple that with the hustle ability to boost its physical attacks while having access to Aerial Ace which can't miss, we've got ourselves a pretty legit Pokemon. Ice Beam is here mainly for Lance, and I'm even running Blizzard in case I need to hit both opponents. Common mistake by the way, Hustle only affects the physical move accuracies, so Ice Beam is still 100% and Blizzard is still 70. We're still not done memeing, we're bringing back Katie the Love Disc from our Renegade Platinum solo run. I managed to get a modest one as well, and as you can see from the stats, they gave it a pretty solid boost too. Not quite like Renegade Platinum, but plus 35 to all defenses and to its special attack turns this Pokemon into a certified tank. We've got the Swift Swim Rain Dance combination. I don't think the Elite Four will have much weather, but being able to get up plus two speed and boost Surf's power, which hits both Pokemon, will be scarily good. 
Last but not least, we're keeping that same unknown on the squad. I put a quick claw on it, but honestly, I'm expecting Lady Anne to be able to get up screens and pass agilities to it for a late game sweep. Just set your eyes on that magnificent special attack. I feel like this Elite Four will either go surprisingly well or surprisingly awful. Anyways, without further ado, let's get straight into the battles. First up to bat is Lorelei with a Cloyster and Dugong combination. I lead off with Lady Anne and Plusle. Lady Anne's here for setting up Light Screen, and Plusle is to start doing damage already with Thunderbolt. Unfortunately, Plusle does get faked out, but that's just delaying the inevitable here. Blizzard from Cloyster's poor special attack does nothing, and this is where the support moves really come into play. I Encore Dugong into Fake Out, which means it's pretty much a sitting duck for the rest of the battle, and I can just focus on setting up on the left side. After getting up an agility the previous turn, I can now Baton Pass into any threat I want while Plusle takes out Cloyster with Thunderbolt, allowing me a free switch into anything I want while carrying over the plus 2 speed. Y'all already know I gotta go into Unknown with its crazy special attack. Now you guys will witness absolute domination here. I try to go for HP Dark on Slowbro, but funnily enough, Plusle still outspeeds plus 2 Unknown, and just outright kills it with Thunderbolt, meaning the incoming Lapras will have to take the HP Dark instead, which is totally fine because it puts it in range of yet another T-Bolt. Dugong is still stuck faking out on the right, and at this point, we're just stomping through Lorelei's team. I totally forgot Jinx was her last, so I went for Psychic instead of HP Dark, but doesn't really end up mattering as Lorelei stupidly goes for fake out on Plusle, meaning Unknown doesn't even get touched and can just HP Dark it for the KO. And then of course, her last Pokemon is poor Dugong, which never broke out of that Encore, and we just destroy it with Thunderbolt for the easy victory. Up next is Kanto Bruno. I lead with Love Disk and Delibird to take on Hitmonchan and Onyx. This strategy worked out very well. You're about to see the cleanest sweep of all time. Aerial Ace completely takes out Hitmonchan while Surf takes out Onyx and gets a little bit of token damage off on Hitmonlee. Not like I needed it though because I can just Aerial Ace again the following turn and easily take out these garbage physical defenders. Another Onyx comes out again, which means Love Disk can just go for Surf and get off crucial damage I need on Machamp to be able to take it out once again with a single Aerial Ace. Yep, that's pretty much the game. Easiest sweep of my entire life. Just take a look at Bruno turn away in shame. Next, I was not expecting Agatha to be quite as easy, and it definitely wasn't. Dunsparce gets his first action next to Lady Anne, as Agatha leads Golbat and Gengar. My idea here is to set up with Lady Anne to Baton Pass to Unknown once again, while Dunsparce can just spam T-Wave to allow an easier time to set up. After getting up Light Screen, Lady Anne continues to set up, ignoring its confusion as I get up in Agility, while Golbat's Air Cutter is doing no damage whatsoever. I start spamming Rock Slide to hit Golbat super effectively, and to Paraflinch Gengar, but it doesn't quite do that. Gengar is able to still get off a Fire Punch on Lady Anne. Luckily though, we have that crazy high speed F and the Light Screen up, and then Lady Anne once again doesn't hit itself in confusion, and is able to pass that plus 2 speed to Unknown. More status starts to happen, I get off a T-Wave on Golbat too, while Gengar Confuse raised Dunsparce, and then I find out that you actually baton past the confusion. I swear I learn something new every day in this game, but anyways, Unknown hits itself in confusion, and now my plan is stalled an extra turn. I'm fearing the double attack on Unknown, but luckily, Dunsparce is able to get off Rock Slide, Gengar gets fully paralyzed, and Air Cutter actually misses Unknown. And finally, we snap out of Confusion, which means the sweep should start now. Gengar goes down easily to Psychic, and then Arbok comes out. It's so weird to me how we always think of Agatha as the Ghost Elite 4 member, but she's really got all Poison types, which makes this even easier for Unknown. I feel like Psychic could have taken out three whole Arboks, and then even though Golbat crits Unknown with Air Cutter, we're still hanging on for dear life to get off another hit. After also taking out Haunter, Unknown's done its job for the most part. Gengar does take it out with Air Cutter for my first death of the Elite Four. But at this point, Delibird can just come in, outspeed and one-shot a Gengar with a crit aerial ace that probably didn't even matter. And finally, after so many turns, Golbat goes down to Dunsparce's Rock Slide. A little bit more of a stally game, but well played nonetheless, and now we can move onwards to Lance. Remember how Bruno's game went? You'd think it wouldn't be possible to destroy someone any harder, right? Well, you'd be wrong, cause Lance was an absolute joke. I lead off with Plusle and Delibird, Plusle is obviously here to take out Gyarados with Thunderbolt, and then because of the significant special attack boost, Delibird's Ice Beam is a straight up Oko on Dragonair. Remember how I added Blizzard to my moveset just in case I needed to double attack? Well, now's a real good time for that. I use Helping Hand with Plusle just for the added BM overkill, and Blizzard 
lands on Dragonite first, which is times four super effective and an easy Oko. And then it also hits Dragonair, yet another easy Oko, meaning that only Aerodactyl is left, which I can take out with Thunderbolt. Yeah, we just kind of beat Lance of all people with a Plusle and Delibird in three turns, which is just absolute destruction. Last but not least, you guys know the storyline, our rival is the current champion, but not if we have something to say about it. He leads with Zam and Pidgeot as always, my strategy here is to take out Pidgeot right away with Thunderbolt, and then set up a light screen with Lady Ann. Everything works out perfectly so far, in comes Blastoise after Pidgeot goes down, but Zam actually goes for a Calm Mind. Once again, I'm going to fire off an Encore to render it useless for a few turns, although I do need to pay attention to it and make sure that Encore doesn't end and I get swept. Blastoise sets up a Rain Dance that really doesn't affect my team in any way, so now I can just Baton pass out into Unknown as always. Unfortunately, because Blastoise is so high level, Plusle's T-Bolt misses out on the KO, but Blastoise went for a non-stab Ice Beam intended for Lady Anne, which hits Unknown for very little damage. This is the part where I kind of realize I'm going to need to start hitting Alakazam before it gets off too many Calm Minds. HP Dark honestly does a lot, considering it set up so many Spadef boosts. Blastoise goes down to Thunderbolt, and now we can just focus on taking out Zam the next turn. Sure enough, both Thunderbolt and HP Dark are enough to get rid of that big threat, but since we double attacked it, it now allows Executor to get off a free Sleep Powder on my Unknown. Arcanine comes out next as my light screen wears off, and for the first time in this entire Elite Four, I feel somewhat threatened here. Plusle's T-Bolt appears to be a close to a KO on Arcanine, and then Arcanine catches Unknown sleeping and takes it out with Crunch. No Unknown sweep for us, but at least it makes this battle more interesting. Anyways, I bring out Delibird to take what I figured would be a grass move from Executor. This is a pretty important turn here. I need T-Bolt to KO Arcanine, but it misses out barely. And then to top that off, Delibird's Aerial Ace also brings Executor down to red health, meaning both of Gavin's Pokemon survive and can get off hits. Arcanine actually shows off the Chesto Resto set here, while Executor gets up a light screen of its own, so this battle has turned officially pretty annoying. I try to Encore Arcanine into Rest, but Gavin's actually a step ahead of me. He definitely did his homework and scouted my Plusle before the game. He goes for E-Speed, which means I Encore him into an attacking move, which isn't the end of the world since it also means he can't hit Delibird with a fire move, while we finally get rid of Executor. Gavin's final Pokemon is Rhydon. Since there's a Light Screen up, I'm pretty sure Ice Beam won't kill, so we actually negate the Light Screen with Helping Hand just to take care of Rhydon first so that we can now focus on his last Pokemon, Arcanine. E-Speed takes out Delibird. I believe this is the first time I've lost multiple Pokemon this Elite Four, but y'all remember, I still got a whole Love Disk in the back. Surprisingly, Arcanine takes two T-Bolts and a super effective Surf with the light screen up, which is actually insane. And Gavin proceeds to take out Plusle with E-Speed, just to make sure this is a 3-0 instead of a 4-0. I guess that might help Massage's ego a little bit, but not really, because I show off my last Pokemon here in Dunsparce while taking him out with Love Dis, just to rub it in his face that he just lost to a total derp squad. Anyways, that's the championship win for us, and that's also the video. As always, thank you so much for watching. I know this probably felt a little bit rushed near the end, but there's just so much extra content in this game, and maybe you can just see the rest of it for yourselves. Don't worry, I always get asked for the downloads of the ROM hack, so I will make sure to leave the link in the description. Do yourself a favor and try it out, guys. Huge shout out to Devlin once again for creating a very fun ROM hack. Next video, we'll be back to the Emerald Kaizo Monotype series. As always, please leave a like on this video if you enjoyed, subscribe and hit the bell if you're new and want to see more content, and I'll see you guys next time.